Well, it's hard to believe that it's been three months. Uh, Three months ago, I was just being released from uh, the hospital after uh, fracturing my C7, basically breaking my neck um, and my left wrist. Um, Three months ago, I still had a bunch of stitches in my face. Uh, This wasn't just a cool scar. It was actually uh, full of uh, lots of stitches. I was in a super comfortable neck brace um, for most of the summer. Uh, A a plaster cast both times. I never got to that really cool fiberglass one. I never got to pick the pink or the fun colors. I actually, when I was uh, in there last, there was a a young girl who was getting a pink cast put on. I was like, I never got to pick a pink color cast from her. But that was only three months ago. And uh, I had a checkup with both of my doctors uh, just the other week. And uh, I got the, I graduated. That's what they said. I graduated from, um, for my final checkup. I don't have to go back. Um, the bone has, yeah. I have, I have full mobility of my neck. Uh, I never lost any feeling or anything like that. I have full mobility of my neck. That's back to 100%. I, I tell people I'm about 95% with my, with my left hand. Uh, I can drum, but guitar is still a bit of a challenge, but we're, we're getting there. Um, and when I went to my checkup, my... Uh, my doctor, he's awesome. Chris Graham is his name. And, and he said, show me, your, uh, show me your movement. And so I was like going like this. He's like, what, wait, sh- when was it again? And I was like, July 9th. And he's like, okay. He's like, figuring out the math. And then uh, I hope he's better at math when he's like actually doing stuff. But uh, it's like three months. And uh, so then he's like, wow. He's like, you are light years ahead of where most people are when it comes to recovery after, after a break like that. And I said, well, in my line of work, we call that a miracle. And he said, in any line of work, you can call that you can call that a miracle. So, uh, yeah, so I'm nearly back to 100%, and, and uh, I feel very fortunate to be standing here this morning. Uh, I don't take it for granted uh, to be here and recovered and, and recognizing that it has only been um, three months since that happened. And I, and I stand before you as somebody who has maybe a bit of a renewed passion for what's God, what God is doing in my own life and what God's doing in us here at Grace Community Church. Uh, I feel a little bit like... Uh, things can change in an instant for you. So what are you doing today that's going to make a difference in somebody's life? What are you doing today that could leave a lasting impact? Because you don't, you don't know. You could fall from a 10 foot ladder and I was lucky enough to survive, but there are lots who would fall from that height and not. So I I, I stand here um, as somebody who's incredibly grateful. This Thanksgiving was a a great Thanksgiving for us, knowing that it could have been very different uh, for our family. I shared a couple of weeks ago a few of the things that God had sort of impressed on my heart while I was laid up. And I did spend a lot of time uh, reading. Those of you who know me know that I love to read. I am on Goodreads and I set a goal. Last year I set a goal to read one book a week. So it was 52 books. Uh, I nailed that goal. So this year I was like, okay, I have to challenge myself a little bit more. So I was going to read 60 books uh, this year. Uh, Coming into the summer, it didn't look like I was going to make my goal. Uh, But then I was laid up for three months or two months. And uh, I'm at 47 books right now. So um, I also read a lot of scripture. I spent a a lot of time reading about the church. I read books about leadership. I read books on humility and vulnerability. And and if you want some book recommendations, I've read a few really challenging great books this um, past little while. But I also spent a, a lot of time praying. And I spent a lot of time praying because I had this nagging question that kind of kept coming up over and over again. As I was thinking about where we're headed in the next little while, who we are as Grace Community Church, I've been here for a little over two years. The question kept coming up and it, was, it would come in different forms, but it basically came up, who are we? Who are we as a body? Who are we as a church? Where, who are we becoming? What are, what are we, where are we headed as a church? What's, what's the point of our existence? Why, why are we here? What's our mission? Who are we? And over the next few weeks, we're going to dig into some of the things that I, I feel like God maybe laid on our heart that seem to sort of jive with where we're headed right now. Nothing really earth shattering. I don't, we're not, you know, tearing down the walls and building a $700 million facility or anything like that. Um, but, yeah, what? <laughs> but just some words that kind of relate on my heart to help refocus my own vision and mission, my own reason for existing, and, and for this purpose, for this hour, why we're here. And so well, we're going to dig into that over the next couple of weeks. And the, the passage of scripture that I kept coming back to over and over again over the last few months is, is John chapter 1. It's the first 15, 14 verses that we're actually going to spend some time in 
this morning. And I feel like I say this a lot, but if you're wondering where to start with reading the Bible, I'd encourage you not to start with page one. Um, Genesis is an exciting read. There's lots of good stuff in there. Exodus, pretty good story too, but you're going to get bogged down by the time you reach the third book, Leviticus. And you might get discouraged. You might just be like, what have I got myself into? So I would suggest start, start with one of the New Testament Gospels. John is one of my favorites. I would start with that one. We're going to start with that this morning. Um, and that's where we're going to kind of head. If you don't have a Bible with you, you didn't bring one with you, that's okay. You can download one onto your phone. We have paperback ones just sitting on the ledge of the sound booth there. You're welcome to grab one for this morning or to take one home with you. If your life is already like mine in entirely on this little device, um, I'd suggest you down version, download version. It's a great Bible app. It's got a number of different translations on there. There's reading plans. Each week we update the event so that you can follow along with the sermon and all the um, sermon passages are in there and a spot where you can take your own notes if you want. The announcements, bulletin, online giving, all of that's right there. It's like we, we got an app for free for the church is basically what we're doing right there. So... But if you have it, you can go to the event and you will find John 1, verses 1 to 14 is where we are starting this morning. John writes, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is not John the one who's writing. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Oh, if that doesn't describe my neighborhood right now. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So far for this morning. This has to be the starting point for me uh, with everything that I do. That it has to come back to this picture of the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That the light has come into the world and maybe the world doesn't recognize it, but even though they were created by him, they don't necessarily receive it. The word has come full of grace and truth. It's interesting that this is, this is a passage that's talking about Jesus, but you don't see the word Jesus anywhere in this passage. It all starts with him, this one who comes from the Father full of grace and truth. And without getting too theologically nerdy this morning, I want to clear up some common misconceptions about this little passage. Because John begins with this phrase. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. The Word was with God and the Word was God. In the beginning, John intentionally wants you to think back to the book of Genesis. He wants you to think back to, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he starts off his gospel with, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He wanted to hearken our thoughts back to this origin story and and to think back to when God spoke light into the world. That God created. It's possible that he's also putting a little nudge towards Mark, who had written another gospel, who says the beginning of the gospel, or the beginning of the good news of Jesus, where he's saying like, yeah, 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 this is the start of Jesus' ministry, but it goes way farther back than that. The beginning where Jesus, the word, was in the very beginning, back at the origin. John goes all the way back. He says that Jesus was there in the beginning, that Jesus was God. Now, this might not seem immediately apparent because in our English, we translate this word 
word with a capital W. There's no actual mention of Jesus in this passage at all. And that's where some of the confusion lies. Because that word, word, is capitalized. The Greek word there is logos. For those of you who are Greek nerds, there's your Greek lesson for the day. Logos. Now, logos is a really big word word. We don't actually have an English translation for it. You can't find it in German. Um, there's, there's no direct translation from the Greek that makes sense that fully encapsulates what logos means. The closest thing we've come to is word, but we have to capitalize it because it means more than just a word or the words of God. It doesn't fully capture what John's getting at when we just say Word. You see, this idea of logos was something that was pretty common for the Jewish people and for the Greek people. And John was the first um, writer to try and tackle both audiences. He was really concerned with getting this message out beyond just those Jewish believers who had already found Jesus to be the Messiah or who were wrestling with, is this guy actually the Messiah? So he doesn't begin with a bunch of genealogies and explaining, well, here, here he is coming from the line of King David. And you, he, these are all of the different people who were born in between to prove that he was from the line of David. He, he doesn't bother with any of that stuff because he wants to get both Jews and Greeks to recognize that Jesus is more than just a great teacher. Jesus is more than just some rabbi who has been healing people in the vicinity of Jerusalem. So he's trying to communicate to these two audiences and he, he comes to this idea that there is this idea of logos in both Hebrew thought and in Greek thought. And Jesus is sort of that logos in both, um, in both senses. So he, he takes this word which is bigger than what we can actually wrap our mind around and he's trying to communicate to Hebrew people who would have something in their mind of this idea of the like the word of God or the, the creative action of God that in the beginning God spoke spoke and creation happened. It was more than just a word. It was light happened when God spoke. So this idea of logos has got this really big meaning even for the Jews. Uh, it's why the Jews, they, they believed words really meant something. Uh, we're very, um, we're not very careful with our words. Uh, we say stuff, we spout stuff, we tweet stuff, we, Facebook is awesome for this, we like blah, 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 out a bunch of words and then we realize the impact of what those words might be. Uh, for a Jewish person, if you, if the average person spoke say 20,000 words a day, a Jewish person would try and do about 2,000. Because your words had meaning and your words had power and you chose your words very carefully. So this idea of Logos, this idea of the word and God's words was something that was, had incredible power and meaning. It was this creative action of God in the world, world. He spoke and there was light. He spoke and there was the heavens and the earth. It was more than just something you'd find on a page. It was more than just a sound that your vocal cords make. The, the word meant wisdom. It meant creation. It meant Reason It meant the active work of God. It was God moving amongst his creation. So this is the word for Hebrew people. In the beginning was the word. It was this creative power. It was this thing that God was doing where he was creating the world and then speaking into, into it. This is the word. This is logos for the Hebrew people. For the Greeks, logos had a similar meaning, but it was much more wrapped up in the idea of creation following a certain pattern in a way of things. Um, it's amazing to me how creation, we have seasons, we have things that you can kind of count on. Uh, snow in October is not one of the things that you should be counting on. But for the most part, we, we look at the rhythms of the way this world works. And you can count on the fact that tomorrow morning, Unless Jesus returns, tomorrow morning the sun is going to rise. And we can set our rocks to what time tomorrow the sun should rise at and what time it's going to set. And if you wanted to send a rocket to a certain place to arrive in 35 years from now, you can mathematically figure out where that rocket is going to end up because all of creation works on these mathematical principles that there's some sort of mind behind all of it. And the Greeks believed that. They didn't necessarily believe in the God of the Bible, but they believed that there was this order to creation. That there, Otherwise, it would be just chaos. They, there would just be no, um, no order to things. So they had this word for it. They called it the Logos. The Logos was the thing that ordered all of creation and it kept things from being uh, just flying off the handle and being out of control. It was the reason or the logic behind everything. 
And so that's what it meant for the, for the Greek people. And John is saying that Jesus, that's who Jesus is. Jesus is the reason. He is the, he is the order to the chaos. He is the creative force of God. In some way, Jesus fits into this idea of Logos. Now, Logos is even bigger than the idea of a, um, of a human being coming as Jesus. But John is saying, it's not, it's not just a guy who's teaching. It's not just a guy who's healing. He's God. And he was in the beginning with God. He is the wisdom, the reason, the creative force for good that came to earth. So Jesus is the word. Jesus is the Logos. And some of the confusion is, we think that this is the word. That this book, that this is what, this is what was in the beginning. That this was the thing that came and that God created in the beginning. This was not created at the beginning of time. So much of our history as believers in Jehovah was oral tradition. It was passed down from generation to generation. And it wasn't written into text that we could hang on to till well into this journey with Jehovah. So when it says in the beginning is the word, it's not talking about the Bible. It's talking about Jesus. And it's claiming that Jesus is divine. Make no mistake, John begins his gospel by saying, this Jesus is God. Everything was made through him and nothing was made without him. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. Thus ends our theological nerdy deep dive in under 10 minutes. (laughs) Discuss amongst yourselves a little coffee talk later. Jesus is the Logos. Discuss. He is the word and the word became flesh. This logos, this creative force, this reason, this logic behind all things became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The message says that he took on flesh and moved into the neighborhood. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Now, I don't know if there's a better description of God's creative intention, of God's design for humanity, of God's wanting to move into relationship with him, than to send his son full of grace and truth. I would love that to be the way I was described to others. Scott, yeah, he's a good dude. He's full of grace and truth. I'd love for that to be the description of a church, our church. It wouldn't just be our name that we'd be known for being full of grace and truth. It's the word grace that I want to focus a little bit on this morning. When I was asking that question over and over again as I was laid up, I I came back to a few different words that I found really helpful. But grace seemed to be one that was always rising to the top. And it was in a board meeting just a few... uh, a few weeks ago, actually, we were discussing some of these thoughts and like, where are we headed and what's some of the vision? And, and one, of, one of our members actually said, he, he was like, it's almost like who we are is right in our name. We're grace, community, church. And it's true, our name, our name means something. It's, it wasn't randomly chosen. I think, I, I would, I'm not a hyper, hyper Pentecostal guy, but I would say there was maybe even something prophetic about the fact that we are grace. There is something about that name, about who we are, who we are becoming. It's our identity. It's not just a sign out on the highway. We're grace, community, church. And it was a bit of an aha moment, a moment when we said like, We're grace for everyone. We're community for everyone. We want to be a church for everyone. So that's where we're going over the next few weeks. Who are we? We're grace. And what does that mean? Jesus came full of grace and truth. He came that we might experience his grace and walk in it. He came that we might know, that we might receive him. Because it says, to those who believed and received him, he gave them the right to become children of God. And that is what we are, children of God. This is the grace that's been shown to us, that God became human, dwelt among us, that we might have his life living in us. So the call for us, similar to the song we just sang, is to pass that grace on that's been so richly given to us. 
Paul, one of the authors of the New Testament, wrote a number of letters, and uh, some of them he wrote to specific churches to deal with some of the issues that they were wrestling with. Some of them he wrote to specific pastors who were going to bring some leadership over those issues. And in one of those letters, he writes to a young man named Timothy, or to Titus. And when he's writing to Titus, he, he's encouraging him in ways that he can continue to lead this church into a fuller um, experience of who God is and what his grace is for their community. And so he says in, in uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, he says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, and to be ready to do whatever is good. To slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and desires. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, because of his grace. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. So this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Paul asks Titus to remind the people to be ready to do whatever is good. To slander no one. To be peaceable and considerate. To always be gentle towards everyone. He said, this is a trustworthy saying. Encourage the people to be ready to do whatever is good. Why? Because at one time, we were in their shoes. At one time, we were in the same place that they were. At one time, we too were foolish and disobedient. We were deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. At one time, we were in the exact same place. We were once unaware of the grace that was being extended to us. We didn't recognize that light that had come into the world. We were unaware of this Jesus, the one who had come full of grace and truth. So we need to help people see. We need to help them recognize this one full of grace and truth. Because when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, that the grace was extended to us, he saved us. Not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, not because of the righteous things we'd done, but because of his mercy. Grace came to us. We didn't go we didn't go out to get it. We didn't seek it. It came to us. And so now we need to reveal it to others. We need to share this amazing grace with others. When you look at people who don't believe the same thing as you do, what's the first thing that goes through your heart? What's the first thing that goes through your mind? Is your first thought to, well, I'm going to set them straight. Uh, I know the way, the truth, and the life, and uh, you're going to hear about it for me right now. Do you see it as an argument to win? Do you see it as, oh, okay, we're going we're gonna to sort this out. I'm going to show you just how wrong you are. When you look at people who don't believe the same as you, is that your first thought or is it, is it compassion? Is it a longing for them to experience the same grace and forgiveness that you enjoy? Is that the way that you lead with your conversation? When you see someone making choices that negatively affect their lives, are you moved to compassion? Or does judgment rise up? Is your first thought, well, pfft, well that's not going to go well for you. Is grace your modus operandi? It is, is it the thing that moves and drives you as a follower of Jesus? Is it to see his grace extended to those who have not yet experienced it? Like Jesus, are you able to lead with grace? It said that he came full of grace and truth. And sometimes we run right to the truth part. We run right to the like, but this is the way it is. I love the message that Jamie preached a few months ago where he said like, sometimes things are true, but they're not beneficial. 
hearing them at a certain point in time doesn't necessarily help you get any closer to Jesus. It may be true, but it may not be helpful or beneficial. But if you come with grace and truth, things look very different. Can you lead like Jesus and lead with grace to see them as sheep without a shepherd, to see them in need of direction and be filled with compassion? Jesus who said, how I long to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks. It says that he saw the crowds and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion on them. Jesus always started with grace, especially when it came to sinners, to people who were not recognizing that grace in their lives. The harsh words that he had, the truth that he brought out, were for the religious elite who thought they had it all together. The clearing of the temple, you'll remember the brood of vipers comments that he would make to the, to the Pharisees. It was to the people who thought they had God all figured out that he shared the truth maybe a little bit more harshly. But to the ragamuffin, to the, the one who was beat down, to the bedraggled ones, he bent low and he met them where they were at. One of my favorite stories is the woman caught in adultery. And the, the teachers of the law, they bring her forward. So it says that she was caught in the act of adultery. There's, there's a pretty good chance she's wearing next to nothing if she's wearing anything at all. So she's almost naked standing in front of all of these men. She's been dragged in front. I wonder why the guy wasn't dragged in front. He was also caught in his act of adultery. But um, she's dragged in front of Jesus. And they say the law says, the truth says, Jesus, we get to stone her. Or we should stone her for this, this act. What do you say? And Jesus bends down. He bends down and he writes something in the sand. And then he says, Let him who is without sin throw the first stone. And one by one, and it says it's from the oldest to the youngest, they just start dropping their rocks and walking away. And then he says, Who is here to condemn you? Who's left? No one. Neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Full of grace and truth. Scripture says that he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, that he, he washed our feet. Think about that for a second. The Word, the Logos, the Creator of all things, washed dirty feet. He touched lepers. He met those people who were without hope and brought them grace. And we all were in the same shoes. Maybe you grew up in a Christian home. Maybe you, ha maybe you don't have a long, torrid tale of like wicked things that you've done. But we have all been in a place where we didn't understand the grace of God. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short. Grace has been extended to us. And if we've received it, if we've accepted it, why would we hold it back from anyone else? We need to lead with grace because we are grace. Grace should be our first impulse. Come all who are thirsty. Welcome to the table. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I love the picture that we are beggars who found bread who are now telling other people where to find the same bread. Come as you are, beat down, broken, busted up. All who are worn, wayward, and torn, you're welcome here. Because we're grace. Because grace has been given to us, we show it to others. We are grace for everyone. The command of Jesus is that we would show that same grace to everyone. Everyone? Your neighbor that's kind of hard to love? Paul writes, be peaceable and considerate. Your co-worker that you think is a total idiot? Be gentle towards everyone. That family member that drives you up the wall? Slander no one. That neighborhood that you'd rather just drive past and ignore? Carry on to your comfortable safe place. Be ready to do whatever is good. 
Remind the people, be subject to rulers and authorities, be obedient, be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. Everyone? Yes. Grace for everyone. Because the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Lord, I confess that I, I often forget where I came from. And it's, it's easy to forget that teenager who was so lost and so without hope who was drowning his sorrows on the weekends, trying to deal with his anger all on his own, sinking into depression. It's sometimes hard to remember that moment where the scales fell off and I realized that you loved me and that you had called me a son. And it it sometimes feels like such a long time ago. And especially when I look at friends or family members or people in my community who, who seem far from you, who don't seem uh, to have experienced the same grace and mercy or maybe not living in the same freedom that I'm currently enjoying. And, and it's sometimes easy for me to judge and forget that I was, I was in the exact same shoes. I was in the exact same spot. And if it wasn't for your grace, if it wasn't for your work in my heart, there's... I don't know where I'd be. But Lord, I want, I want to be grace. I want to be a conduit of your grace for those, who, for those who are walking in darkness and don't recognize the light. For those who don't recognize that though they were created by you, they have nothing or want nothing to do with you. Lord, that I would show grace to everyone, that I'd be ready to do whatever is good, that I'd be ready to say what you ask me to say, that I'd be ready to walk alongside whoever you ask me to walk alongside, that I too would mirror your life full of grace and truth. And I pray that for my friends who are sitting here who are maybe feeling uh, something in their own heart stirring. Maybe they've got a a person that's rolling through their mind that they've had a tough time loving recently. Lord, would you fill them with your grace and your love that it might be poured out to that person they're thinking about right now. That they would have an opportunity, maybe even this week, to have a conversation that would be a step in the right direction to be peaceable and considerate and to see you at work in some of those tough situations in our lives. For our friends who seem far from you, we, we continue to ask your spirit to work and draw on their hearts. Not so that we can have more people, not th- so that we can get people on our side, but so that people can experience your grace. That they might know this love, they might know this hope that is ours, that their joy may be complete because of what you are at work doing in them. And so, Jesus, we do ask that you would help us. Help us to be your representatives wherever we go. And that we would be ready to do whatever you call us. That we would be, uh, as individuals, filled with grace and truth. That this church would be known as a place where people find grace. Grace for everyone. And that we might reveal your goodness in this place, in this time that we would see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'll send you with this benediction as you head out for the rest of your week. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.
Amen. Have a great week, everybody. We will see you next Sunday. Don't forget to pick up some shoe boxes on your way out. You can grab them here at the front. There's also a cart at the back um, by the door. Grab a couple, fill them up. They need to be back here November the 12th.